lived in the projects, you're going to stay there. Your plight of who you are, what you are will stay the same. And if you do get out, then there's a criminal justice system that will bring you back and imprison you in a different way. We can't imprison you. And I think at that time we had 150,000 people in prison. We can't imprison you the other way. Uh, we'll imprison you this way. And so I know we, your, your, your research talk about public health, but I think this is also a public health crisis um, as far as the criminal justice system and how it impacts everything you just said um, in, in a most adverse way. So do you have any ideas or things that, that we could do to kind of reverse that too? Because we got to have some solutions to that because at the end of the day, um, everything we do, um, the 13th Amendment and that little clause will continue to haunt this, will haunt Black people forever. It's such an important issue. We actually have a report that's going to be coming out about it, probably in the course of the next month. Um, and it's really focused on um, the kinds of investments in community that keep us safe without delivering the kind of harm um, that we see coming out of the incarceration system. And Barhai had supported um, you know, a, a number of reforms over the last handful of years really focused on this issue. We think mass incarceration has huge health impacts. I not think it, we, we see it in the data. Um, and so we're gonna be sharing some more information about that soon. Um, yeah, your point is I think very well taken. And it has been, and the impacts um, like health show up in every social determinant, right? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, this, is, this is one of these interlocking, just as I talked about the interlocking of the, the education impacts, the public education impacts. And you wanna create more doctors, but if I'm training you to be a rapper or a football player or get involved in the criminal justice system, if that is your base, so I went to USC where they had generations and generations of doctors, lawyers, engineers, architects, and they were proud of that family heritage. If your family heritage in that is something based in the criminal justice system, how do you break that cycle so that you uh, do some do a lot better than what you what your your forefathers have done? Yeah, and I think there's also an opportunity through reparations to be funding. Um, uh, black education facilities, um, uh, black-led training programs that create a lot of the black doctors, a lot of the black medical community, um, and not just doctors. I think that's true for education and all of our systems. We do see the impact of having us in positions of leadership and direct service in our systems as having a really important impact. And I think um, any ways that we can create more opportunities for us to be managing resources and able to do that, I think is really important. But I, I assume the question is for, for others as well. Uh, Madam Chair. Yes, Vice Chair Brown, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair, <clears throat> members of the task force. <clears throat> I'm here in San Francisco. I've been here for 46 years. One thing I want to correct, the black population is not five to six percent. It's more black, four percent, 3.9 to four percent. Number two, let me say respectfully, there's one piece maybe we need to look at. The fact that when a people lose a sense of place, a sense of place, it does have adverse psychological fallout. What am I talking about? It was in 1948 when a so-called program of urban renewal was created by Ali Odo and Justin Herman that the public policy makers, the social engineers, and members of governmental agencies decided they were going to create what was known as black removal. That's what it was. It was systematic black removal. Every other ethnic group. I'm a historian. 
Though they were oppressed, they always had a sense of community and place. Place. But that's not happening in San Francisco. The old Fillmore is practically no more. Back in the 40s, we did have a sense of place. There was a Harlem of the West. But through public policy, I repeat, and I have documents that underscore this, the redevelopment agency pushed black folks out so that consequently, the only place where we have maybe the last vestige of even ownership of black folks is that Heritage Building on the corner of Ed and Fillmore, West Bay, and some beauty shops. You don't ever see black folks in this town unless you go to the barber shop or the beauty shop. That's it. That's a fact. And I hope that we will consider, as we discuss reparations, that wherever in this nation, whether it's South Central Los Angeles, even old Sweet Auburn Avenue in Atlanta, Georgia, 14th Street in Washington, D.C., when you destroy those ethnic cultural watering holes, you create a syndrome in which people don't have a sense of place. Other folks got Chinatown, Japantown in this town, and even you have Little Italy, North Beach. Over in the mission, you got the Latino community, and the white folks got most of the financial district in this town. So I hope that we will remember these salient social historical facts as we consider this matter of reparations. And we need to rebuild these places where we gathered, like other folks have done, to perfect, protect each other against this racist society. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, for letting me share this. But the old preacher, I'm, I'm on the stump. We have got to have a sense of place and stop pushing folks around. If other folks can have them, we should have them. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. Let somebody say amen. Amen. Thank you for that. Um, Member Grills, you are recognized. Um, and thank you to all of the panelists um, for what you shared. It's a sobering moment. Um, when we begin to understand the health uh, impacts of um, multi-generational racism and oppression. Um, I wanted to ask a question specifically related to Black children. Um, in 2019, the American Academy of Pediatrics declared that racism is a social determinant of health um, that has a profound impact on the health status of um, children adol and adolescents and emerging adults and, and their families. And they said that there's evidence to support the continued negative impact of racism on their health and well being through all forms implicit and explicit biases and um, institutional structures, interpersonal relationships. That was in 2019. Also in 2019, the Congressional Black Caucus formed a special committee to examine concerns related to black child suicide. Um, and several of us provided testimony, including the fact that the rise, the rates of suicide were in fact higher and growing at a faster rate among black children than um, the rates for children of other races. Um, and that it was happening alarmingly at a very young age. I'm talking 11 year olds committing suicide by hanging. Uh, so I was wondering if you could speak to any observations you have in your work about Black child and adolescent um, health, public health issues and health outcomes. And if I'm putting you on the spot because you weren't necessarily going to speak to children, then um, that's fine. <laughs> But if you have anything related to that topic, because as we've been, we, you know, we've been talking a lot about the adults um, and our babies are hurting. And I don't want to lose track of what's happening with our children. Well, 
what I what I can say is we've been seeing a lot of emergent research right now about um, COVID and um, children being out of school and the stressors that that's put on particularly Black children and particularly um, senses of isolation and um, that are so important in your adolescent years, um, regardless of race. Um, and so I, I think we we've been seeing more and more of that, but we haven't pulled it all together yet into into um, the understanding of the COVID experience and what, what must come next. Yeah, COVID actually did expose the fact that we were in dire straits long before COVID hit the scene. And in fact, that for Black people, we're not dealing with a pandemic, we're dealing with a, sen a syndemic, which is when you have multiple pandemics colliding um, and having you know, astronomical negative impact. Mm -hmm. I am also hoping to see um, some research about what Black Lives Matter and the social movements and the, uh, the ability to engage and be engaged in that agency um, is doing in terms of a positive, um, sort of positive outlet for some of that work. I mean, I think those will be two interesting pieces to look towards. And I think um, in particular, being able to look towards um, moments of feeling uh, power in agency as a way to understand what a, um, what a value of reparation might be that's in addition to whatever might be monetary or might support the growth of black communities, black, um, black um, business, et cetera. I think there's probably also something in it that's um, less tangible in that way of, of agency and what that does for our mental health that um, would be interested and look, interesting to look into. Thank you. This is, yes. Oh, uh, Dr. Sachs, go ahead. You're recognized. Hi. Sorry. Thank you, uh, Chair, Chairperson Moore. Um, I wanted to just say that I, although I don't work on children's health issues or children's mental health issues, I just wanted to point out a friend and colleague. Her name is Janelle Goodwin, um, and she is a young black woman professor who works specifically on suicide among black youth. And so her work is really, uh, could be potentially informative in this uh, to, to answer your question. Thank you so much. So it is now uh, 3.14, which it'll soon be 3.15. So we will conclude uh, witness panel number two, our panel on public health. On behalf of the esteemed members of the task force, I would like to thank Dr. Roberts, Dr. Sachs, um, Brett Andrews, and Melissa Jones for your wonderful, um, insightful, compelling expert testimony. And we look forward to staying in connection with you all um, as our work uh, progresses. So thank you again. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. Chair, you're muted. Thank you. So was I muted for this entire time? Um, I wanted to say thank you to Dr. Roberts, Dr. Sachs, uh, Brett Andrews, and Melissa Jones uh, for your uh, compelling and thoughtful um, expert testimony. And we look forward to um, staying in connection with you all as our task force um, develops. And so now we'll go to break, which is from 3.15 to 3.30. And um, after that, we will get an update from Member Grills on the community engagement plan. So without further ado, we recess to break.
It is now 3.31 and we will reconvene, but before we reconvene, I'll turn to Parliamentarian Johnson so that she can establish a roll call vote for quorum. Parliamentarian Johnson. Parliamentarian Johnson, you're on mute. Oh, now you're available. Can you hear me on? Yes. Okay, yes. Chair Moore? Okay, I'm sorry. Vice Chair Brown? Present. Member Bradford? Member Grills? Present. Member Holder? Present. Member Joan Sawyer? Member Lewis? Present. Joan Sawyer is here. I, I was on mute. Okay, thank you. Member Tamaki? Present. Member Montgomery Stepp? Present. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, there are eight members present and voting. The quorum is five, and a quorum has been reestablished. Thank you. There are eight members present. A quorum has established, so now the um, task force meeting has officially reconvened. We will now turn to member grills um, and action item number 10, or community engagement plan update. And we have 30 minutes reserved for this discussion. Member grills, you are recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Moore. I'm going to share my screen um, so to have some illustration to accompany the update. Can folks see the um, screen okay? I can't see. Okay, thank you, because I can't see you. <laughs> All right, so um, um, it's actually a pleasure um, to share updates because we have uh, made a lot, uh, covered a lot of ground and, and um, um, made a lot of um, uh, important um, decisions. So starting out, in terms of summarizing what's been accomplished to date, there are five things I want to share. Um, and starting with the anchor organizations, we now have seven anchor organizations that have been selected and are part of the community engagement process. These anchor organizations are statewide organizations with or organizations with deep regional roots, um, and they have members or affiliates in multiple areas of the state who's, um, uh, who have the capacity to tap into those affiliates or those, those um, what I call tier two organizations to help with any community engagement process. The seven anchor organizations are listed here for you. And these anchor organizations have networks that extend from eight to 30 plus organizations each. So for example, the anchor organizations cover a variety of regions uh, of the state from Northern, um, and, and Northern California to Southern California, Inland Empire, et cetera. Uh, for example, one anchor organization that's here that you see on the screen actually has an alliance of over 30 grassroots organizations um, in, in, in 16, with 16 um, anchor groups. Uh, spanning 14 counties across the state. So these are community-based organizations spanning urban, rural, and suburban counties in California. Um, they also represent a variety of constituencies, faith-based, youth, incarceration, voting rights, arts, philanthropy, green lining and housing, uh, discrimination, redistricting, college students, cooperative enterprises, uh, and civil rights organizations. We also have selected the communications firms and they, their work has launched. The two communications firms are Young Communications, which is um, local to California, and AB Partners, uh, which is a national um, firm. We also have um, convened the anchor organizations and the conveners uh, and the listening session facilitators have been selected and are engaged in, uh, in the work. The convener of the anchor organizations, this is the person who sets up the agenda, 
um, and uh, facilitates the meeting of the anchor organizations and keeps an eye on the larger goal of ensuring that we reach our goal of uh, 10 to 12 listening sessions across the state. Um, and so that's Mary Lee. And then we have a professional um, facilitator uh, and her name is Ama Nyameche and she um, runs an organization that she founded called Good Influence. We've already held the first um, listening session um, and that was held by the African Black Coalition, which is a, um, a network of um, Black student organizations across the Cal State and UC schools. Um, that their first listening session uh, included 90 Black college students. Uh, it was held around MLK weekend. And in fact, their particular approach to the listening sessions is not a one-off, they in fact will be adding to or supplementing this first listening session, which was rich with ideas and feedback from the uh, students in attendance. But they're supplementing that listening session with college campus visits, um, where they're going to, to do a deeper dive into what the concerns and perspectives are about reparations from black college students and also to gather stories about the harms uh, experienced um, by our students. The fifth area is funding. So while the community engagement process did receive some financial support from um, resources within the state and, um, in terms of the Department of Justice, we also needed to supplement that so that we could have a robust uh, process. And so what we were able to do thus far, um, working with the Bunch Center, we have a grant from the California Wellness Foundation, and we have meetings coming up in the next uh, two weeks to add to the funding that the Wellness Foundation has provided. And they're providing funding to support the media component in particular. Um, and to support the work that the anchor organizations and their local community-based uh, ally organizations uh, will do to ensure that we have a good turnout and we have a diversity of um, folks across the state who are sharing what their thoughts are regarding reparation. This is, an this is actually a picture from the first anchor org meeting. It's not everybody in the picture, but it gives you a sense and I just wanted to point out that we have um, the stars that just popped up are the um, principals or the leads of the communications firm, Gwendolyn Young for Young, Young Communications and Andre Banks for AB Partners. And this is Mary Lee, um, the convener of the Anchor Orgs. And this is Ama Yamiche, um, the professional facilitator. So, the, I'm really excited about the anchor organizations that have been assembled to lead this work. Um, and they very much, we just had another meeting um, in the last week, and they are definitely, well, not in the last week, but at the beginning of this week, and they are definitely thinking out of the box, very creatively, uh, about how to do these listening sessions. There is not a cookie cutter approach. It's not one size fits all. They are tailoring the approach to listening sessions based on the constituents that they are trying to engage. So their engagement strategies, the issue focus around which people may be coming together to talk about reparations or the sections of the state um, are all things that they have begun deliberating about and beginning to define what their listening sessions will look like. Some of them will be virtual, some of them will be in person, some of them will be hybrid. Uh, there's going to be a, a concerted effort to collect stories about the harm, the personal stories of harm, family harm, um, as well as current harm, uh, using um, various digital platforms uh, where people don't have to be at the listening session in order to have their say or to make their voices um, heard. There's also going to be a lot of variety in the messaging that will be happening. Um, this, this involves coordinated communication strategies to inform and engage. And so part of what will happen is that 
in anticipation or prior to any particular listening session, we will make sure that there is some messaging that comes out in advance so that people know about the task force, know about the charge of the task force, know that the listening session is going to be happening, know what the topics um, are going to be uh, focused on. Uh, and then the, when the information is gathered and there'll be note takers at each listening session, um, we will then be able to use the information as it's coming in from listening session to listening session to further develop and nuance um, future uh, messaging. I, I hope that um, at any given listening session that at least one, um, but of course because of restrictions, no more than two, task force members will be able to sit in and observe uh, any particular listening session. But that is our only role is to sit in and observe. We are not defining what the listening sessions are looking at, where they're going to happen, uh, or anything of that nature. Lastly, I'm really excited about the ability to do some coordination here. So we are coordinating the, our listening sessions with what I'm calling reparations ready counties and cities in California. So thanks to the help of member Tamaki, I've held, held meetings with each of the governmental uh, entities that you see on the screen. Uh, the, city, the cities of Los Angeles, Berkeley, San Francisco and Sacramento have their own versions or some form of either reparations commission task force uh, or um, county um, uh, bills that are about to be um, made public to launch a reparations effort specific to their uh, regional location. Um, they are all, uh, and then also the county of Alameda. Um, all of these governmental entities uh, are eager to partner on both the listening sessions and communication strategy to mutually maxi maximize their efforts related to reparations, as well as the efforts of the task force. It's a win-win uh, for everyone all the way around. Another important feature to the task force uh, community engagement process um, is a reparation survey. So Professor Michael Stoll, um, who's leading the Bunch Center's community engagement uh, process for the task force, is um, aligning a survey that will be used as part of the um, reparations community engagement process. He's developing the survey to align with a national survey that has already been conducted of over 5,000 people on the topic of reparations, trying to determine general support for reparations and uh, what people's thoughts are um, or attitudes or, or um, perspectives are on the forms of reparation. Our task force survey instrument um, is going to query opinion about reparations in California specifically, but we will be able to compare what California looks like with the rest of the country. Um, it will um, share a similar set of questions to that national survey that was administered by Liberation Ventures and Policy Link. Um, and there will be, um, for California, a representative sample of about 2,000 um, uh, residents in California. It will include more questions than the national survey. Um, for example, it will include some information about how much support there is for different types of rep reparations, eligibility um, perspectives people have, um, and um, we'll be able to look at demographics, like it, it, does everyone feel the same or does one particular demographic, let's say an age group or gender or location in the state um, have a different um, perspective or opinion. Um, there, we hope to go into the field or Professor Stoll, because he's leading this, um, within the next two months. So those surveys will be administered at the listening sessions, but they'll also be administered above and beyond the listening sessions to that random representative sample statewide. Um, so again, there's reparations opinions that will be gathered. It'll align with the national, that sample of 2000, 
um, and uh, launching in the next two months. And that data should help to inform us truly what is the community perspective writ large across different um, sectors uh, of, the <coughs> of the community of California and in particular the black community in um, California. In terms of the communications firms, I just wanted to share that they have developed a communications framework. I'm not going to try to explain this framework to you. They presented this to uh, several of us um, a week ago, but they have identified milestones and a framework that looks at issues such as mass awareness, community listening, story, story collection and training, advocacy um, and um, media, how to amplify the process and outcome of our work um, in this area. So that's just a kind of quick summary. And I'd like to open it up to any questions uh, at this time. And I will stop sharing my screen. Okay, thank you, Member Grills, for um, such a comprehensive uh, presentation. Um, and for all the work that you've been doing behind the scenes to make this community engagement process a reality, um, I'm incredibly indebted and, and grateful for the work that you've been doing on this. Uh, Vice Chair Brown, you are recognized. Uh, Madam Chair and members of the task force, uh, Dr. Grills uh, is a platform, a forum for the interfaith community and African-American community. Yes, some of the anchor organizations actually, some of the anchor organizations actually work with the faith-based communities. I'm talking about the faith-based community. The faith-based community is our community, historically. So I'm not understanding your question. Could you repeat it? Well, there is the African-American faith community. Yes. We have these other organizations who are engaged. Have we, have we thought of engaging the African-American faith community? Yes, they will definitely be engaged. Yes. Okay. Member uh, Montgomery Step, you're recognized. Thank you, Chair Moore. Uh, Dr. Grills, thank you so much. Um, exciting up update. Um, a lot of work obviously has gone into it. I just have a quick question about, uh, I guess, the relationship between the city, county ready um, uh, cities and county that you listed and the acre organizations. Um, I saw uh, one or two San Diego folks on the screenshot, so I was happy about that because I, I was looking. Uh, <laughs> But um, but also we're not on that list um, mm -hmm. as a ready city. Um, mm -hmm. So I just want to know what I should be prepared for, how that will impact like listening sessions or anything like that. And and I, I would argue that that maybe having a city council member that serves on the task force could maybe qualify us <laughs> in San Diego. Um, but I just want to know the relationship or how you plan to set that up. Right, so in terms of um, reparations ready, that really only meant that these particular governmental entities already had something in motion. We did not approach them and say, do you want to, but rather they are already, they've already set things up or they've, they're doing work behind the scenes to get board motions out and, and before the public. And so that's why we call, I call them kind of reparations ready. Okay, cool. So they'll be just, they'll be there as uh, additional support in your efforts with the anchor organizations and all the the, the events that we're going to be planning. Okay. All yeah, right. More like collaboration. So let's say that an anchor org is going to do a listening session um, in um, Los Angeles. Um, and so, and the, you know, the city of Los Angeles has a reparations commission. We're going to share information. That listening session is going to be happening on this day with these details. This is the messaging. You want to share, you know, information. You want to, you know, 
put add your your email list or your listserv to ours to get as many people out as possible do you have any input you want to give on the messaging because you understand your location better than anyone else that kind of collaboration okay got it thank you on the task force member tamaki you're recognized Oh my God, I just want to thank Cheryl Grills for doing this enormous amount of work uh, to organize this in such a comprehensive manner. And <clears throat> on top of that, getting the funding, I mean, in addition to augment or supplement the state funding to get this done, particularly for one of the most important parts, was it, which is the communications piece. So it, this this is a tremendous achievement, I think, because um, you know, the task force has been working pretty much under the radar. I, most Californians and people across the nation don't, do not know that we exist. But once the um, community engagement process, the listening sessions um, begin and with the communications consultant, I think that's going to be, that's going to change a lot. And it also elevates uh, the locales, the cities like Sacramento and San Francisco and Los Angeles. Uh, that have already, through their votes of the Board of Supervisors or mayoral action, have implemented uh, this program. And it also gives us a, a pipeline by which uh, the other activities, you know, we're doing can be filtered out to the community. Uh, in June, part one of our report will be uh, in. And I think that's going to have a national impact because of, you know, this documentation of centuries of harm. Um, I mean, the last report on this kind of thing was a Kerner Commission report in 1968, which tried to connect the dots, but literally was about 40 pages of history and then arriving to conclusions that were prescient and very relevant today, sadly. but. Um, not a good job in terms of educating the American public about all this erased history. And then to the extent that the communications consultants and the engagement process itself can augment that by the personal stories and other things that will come out, I, I think it'll be a tremendous achievement and a it's a remarkable deliverable, actually. So <clears throat> I really um, want to congratulate and thank uh, Professor Grills for driving this process almost single-handedly, I have to say, um, because of Bagley Keene and the way you know we're structured. Um, one thing I wanted to add is, and uh, Michael Newman of the DOJ can correct me, but I think as long as um, the task force members don't speak to each other about task force business, any number can attend the listening sessions as simply as members of the audience. Um, and, you know, we can't conduct business there. We can't uh, talk about task force business, but we can certainly listen. So to the extent that, um, you know, uh, we can attend these things, I think it's all to the good, both for the public and for our, ourselves. So thank you very much, uh, Cheryl. Great job. Actually, that's a great question for Michael, because I assumed that we couldn't do more than two people present um, at a listening session. Uh, am I on? Okay. Uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll look into this just to confirm, because these listening sessions are a little bit unique. Um, so I'll consult internally in return with an answer. but. Uh, generally speaking, if you are simp if you're simply attending as a member of the public, obviously no communications can take place. That includes communications um, after the fact uh, to reflect collectively on what took place uh, or to process collectively what took place. The the two person rule still applies, and you it, and you also can't have two people talk and then the, they talk to two other people, that would be 
also a violation where you'd be engaging in a serial meeting. I think Member Holder had a hand. Member Holder, you're okay, nice. Yeah, I was actually just snapping my fingers in response to Member Tamaki's comments about the brilliant work that you've done, Dr. Grills. I am I am in awe and indebted. And I think the amplification of our process is going to really create the sea change. Um, and so we owe that to you. So uh, just, uh, just thank you. I, I did have a question about um, COVID protocols and how that plays in to the listening session or if you know if you've thought about that. Yes, yeah, so that, that's something that the ANCA orgs will deliberate about at their next meeting. I'm sure that will be on the agenda. The first listening session actually ended up being a hybrid. It was supposed to be in person, um, and then they pivoted to it being virtual, but people still came to the in-person. Um, and so they ABC followed their um, UC and Cal State protocols, I guess, around um, um, mitigating COVID risk, um, but <clears throat> I think everybody will be kind of, as they go, seeing where things are at, determining whether or not something can be in person or not. Um, so that, yeah, that's to be determined as they plan. Okay, so I had a, a quick follow-up question. So to the point of the listening sessions, um, and of course this probably doesn't need to be answered now, but I'm just putting it out there. Um, how are task force members like supposed to obtain, you know, any information based on the listening session? So I guess, you know, there was a listening session that happened earlier this month with ABC. Um, you know, what are the, the mechanisms and the ways in which, you know, task force members can receive you know any information whether we're you know if we're not there or present yes um, at the next sessions that's a good question so bunch center is actually creating a portal um uh, that um the for the anchor orgs to um share information um as well as to um be the con uh, having a container to uh have the um uh, the audio video and um summary notes um, for example, from any particular listening session, um, we can make that available. Um, I can ask them if they can make that available to the task force members. But in addition, um, and e at each listening session, there will be note takers. Um, but at the end of the day, there's also going to be a report that Mary Lee and the Bunch Center um, will create to summarize um, what happened across all of the listening sessions. But I will ask um, Mary Lee if she can put that on the agenda um, for the next anchor org meeting uh, about task force members having access to the portal. Thank you. And then my last question is just to clarify, um, you know, whether it's going to be through the Bunt Center or um, um, or through the other entity of uh, where there's going to be like a permanent website or a website that'll exist like for posterity that, um, you know, is a repository of, of um, you know, the task force. Yeah, so th there was actually some discussion about, um, you know, these stories are going to be critically important um, and I would imagine very revealing about the harms, particularly as they relate to California. Um, and so there, there was some beginning discussion about, you know, these are something that, these are things that should be archived somewhere, you know, whether that is like the African American Museum or, you know, a museum here in um, California or a library here in California. So it is on people's radar. Um, that this is something that needs to live beyond the task force. Excellent. Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, any other uh, questions or comments from the task force members on this item? Member Tamaki, you're recognized. I, 
I just had one question, um, <clears throat> Cheryl, and that is, um, is there a way for the the dates of the sessions to be rolled out? <clears throat> I'm just mindful that everybody's busy and their calendars fill quickly. So if we knew where and when uh, early, and I realize anchor sessions are planning the this and picking their own dates, but <clears throat> how can we find out about where and when? So that that was actually the um, meeting that was on Monday with the anchor orgs. Um, one of the major topics of the meeting was getting people's initial ideas and thinking and planning about the who, what, when, where of their listening sessions. Um, that is still a work in progress, but absolutely as soon as that is solidified, and I believe that Mary is trying to call the anchor organizations back together very soon so that we can get those um, details locked in. Once they're defined, they will be made um, available to the task force members because some of them may be right in your backyard and of course you may want to, to go to that or they may be virtual and on a, you know, a, a focus that you want to be able to witness live. And can I just follow up by saying, um, is it possible to, you know, I know there's 10 to 12 listening sessions, but for them to be organized or spaced out in a way that kind of coordinates or goes along with what is like, you know, the end of the life of this task force. So like, you know, these anchor organizations will be doing work alongside us up until July, 2023. Um, yeah, so right now the anchor orgs are really working on a timeline um, that would have us getting a report from um, the Bunch Center in September. So if we end up going beyond that, then um, then I'm I'm back to the drawing board try, trying to get some more funding. <laughs> I see. So, and and I have to also say that that's the case for the communications firms. So we did not set up an agreement with them that they're going to go beyond that particular period. It's clear they're going to be needed. So you know we we need to be thinking down the road. Um, how to keep them engaged, you know, past the conclusion of all of these listening sessions, where we pretty much aligned the communications work with the um, with the listening sessions. Okay, so the scheduled end date for them is September of this year. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. But, yeah, but we, but we, I, like I said, we know that we are definitely going to need the help of the communications firms well past that, especially by the time we get to the second report. Well, thank you again, uh, Member Grills, for your presentation and, of course, for the work that you've been doing on this very important uh, part of our, our um, process. So now I'll turn to um, agenda item number 11, which is potential action item report dictionary update. Uh, which consists of an update between uh, myself and member Joan Sawyer. It, um, I'll turn to member Joan Sawyer and we have 15 minutes for this discussion. Uh, member Joan Sawyer, you are recognized. All right, thank you. Um, so uh, the chair and I met and we kind of preliminarily kind of went over some of the, the, the phrasings, the things that we wanted to talk about um, in that discussion. Um, I reminded uh, Chair Moore that this process, whatever language we come up with or whatever we proceed going forward, also needs to go through a um, through what is our ledge council, and they're the ones that it will actually whatever we recommend, they will actually write either the bill and or the budget um, language that will then come to the members who will eventually vote on whether up or down on what we will, um, as far as reparations are concerned, um, do. Uh, from my experience in, uh, in, in uh, Senator Bradford, was, we're on, a, on, on the call, he would tell you, and no disrespect to the lawyers, lawyers have a way of talking which is different than what we give it to ledge council, and then all of a sudden it is changed in a way where I wasn't very happy. 
And so what I'm going what I'm going to recommend that the committee some kind of understanding agreement with Ledge Council. In addition, um, I came in a little late, but um, the discussion we had with Dr. Weber also made me understand that we really do have to be very intentional and precise with our language, especially with the intent of what the author wanted. And so whatever language we feel comfortable with, uh, I also wanna make sure that the author is also comfortable with that. And I didn't realize that until I came in on the back end of that discussion uh, about uh, who should get reparations and what her, her feelings were and her intentionality. Um, and even when my staff relayed what she said, even I had a little, you know, I had a different interpretation. So if the task force, and I guess in, will, will allow us a little more time to kind of not only narrow down the, the phrasing, the words that we want to move forward with, but also make sure that we have some kind of agreement or understanding across the board so that whatever we decide we want to do, um, we're all on the same page. Because I believe that is what this glossary uh, of the dictionary or whatever you want to call it is about, making sure that we're all speaking the same language and all, all on the same page. Um, that's that's it, unless Chair Moore has more to share. No, yes. So um, thank you so much, Member uh, Reggie Jones Sawyer. And um, for just fuller context, of course, right, um, at our last hearing, we voted to create an advisory committee, which consists of myself and Member Jones Sawyer, uh, to discuss um, what would comprise of a language guide that would assist um, you know, the research attorneys in the California Department of Justice Office um, in terms of the, the types of language and terms that would be used in uh, report one and subsequently in report two as well, uh, just to make sure that the language is you know, up to date, precise, and um, culturally relevant and competent and respectful um, all, of all the communities discussed in the report. And so, as Member uh, Reggie Jones Sawyer mentioned, we, you know, spoke briefly about it. And um, Member Reggie Jones Sawyer, if you could just um, <clears throat> briefly just uh, give an update as to what the recommendation is moving forward in terms of any potential action. Um, right now, I want the, the only action I'm asking is for to give us some more time so we can flush out. Um, not only any potential verbiage, but what to do next, how we should align it with with uh, whatever recommendations uh, we we will ultimately make, um, that we don't make any decisions right now until we get the verbiage and then see how how well it will work moving forward. And uh, so that's that's really what I'm making asking, I don't know if I need a motion, but I'm asking to give us another thirty days until our next meeting. Uh, for us to to do that analysis and to get back to the committee as a whole. Action or vote needs to be taken on the matter. Uh, we just needed to provide a comprehensive update to the task force. Um, and um, yes, we will get back to you all on this at our next meeting. Parliamentarian Johnson, that that is proper, correct? I think I think that is probably fine. I my, when I I say probably only because I don't have the minute portion before me to say whether or not when you authorized the task force to meet, did you limit it to this time? I thought it was just to work on the project. If it was to work on the project, you're fine. You've given a preliminary report, and then you're going to come back with the product. It, it was my understanding that uh, we were given a task, and as soon as we completed the task, we would get back to the task force. I think we wanted to be uh, respect for everyone's time to try to give you updates as we went along. And so you're, you're can, fine. We, can we consider the first update? Yes, Thank you. You're... Thank you very much, Parliamentarian Johnson. And thank you, Member Joan Sawyer. Um, now we will move to um, agenda item number 13, which is information item, uh, Actually, number 12, excuse me, potential public actions, including advocacy letters by the task force. 
So we have 15 minutes for this um, agenda item, and I'll actually turn to uh, Attorney Newman for this portion of the agenda. Uh, Attorney Newman, you are recognized. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chair Moore. I appreciate that. Um, uh, this is a report back uh, from from my last meeting, uh, from your last meeting. Um, as we've previously discussed on other potential action items the task force has considered, the scope of the task force's authority is defined by AB 3121 itself. The statute defines this scope as engaging in findings that will comprise the first report and making recommendations to the legislature that will comprise the second report that you all will be generating in the uh, coming months and, and years. In your last meeting, you requested that I explore the potential authority of the task force to engage in public actions, uh, such as sending letters of support to other reparations initiatives or federal reparations actions. Uh, and uh, I am now reporting back to say that, unfortunately, um, AB 3121 does not authorize the task force to do so. That is not to say that the task force members cannot express opinions on these or other reparations efforts or the federal legislation in each of your individual capacities. And if there were some future requests from the legislature, your opinions or support could be incorporated into either or both of the reports that you will be issuing. You also will be discussing and setting the agendas for future meetings, including tomorrow, you'll be setting those agendas and discussing how you want to approach future meetings. And in those meetings, you can certainly invite witnesses to provide testimony that will highlight other uh, reparations efforts around the country and support other reparations efforts around the country. So that's my um, update and response to your inquiry from the last meeting, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Attorney Newman. Um, just for fuller context, so for instance, um, you know, there's a, a legislative bill um, in California called ACA3, um, which would, would require um, the slavery exception to be eliminated from the California Constitution. And so, um, and then also, you know, there were other, you know, public comments from last meetings asking for the task force to you know, come together and to write some type type of advocacy letter, as mentioned in the uh, public publicized agenda. Um, you know, advocating for federal reparations initiatives. So, from what I'm hearing that you're saying, you're essentially saying, in either of those contexts, um, the task force is not able to, um, you know, convene in that way. Um, right? Just to clarify. Yeah, unfortunately, um, the task force's scope is really defined by the statute. So uh, the statute really calls on the task force to advise the California legislature as to reparations um, in that scope, unless the legislature were to ask for the task force's opinion or recommendation on those other items, the other pending California legislation, the pending federal legislation, or task force activities that are, or reparations activities that are happening in other states, it's really not within the scope of the statute as written. Um, but as I mentioned, there are other outlets in addition to individual task force members, um, you know, weighing in on those. There is, um, there is the option to bring people into the task force for their testimony and incorporate that information into your recommendations, such as recommending that the California legislature um, support uh, federal legislation or, or other recommendations that are included in the report that's mandated by AB 3121. Thank you. Reggie, uh, member Reggie Jones Sawyer. Nice. And, and, yes. And just to give another example or another way we could cooperate. But let me first start with, in full disclosure, uh, it may sound self-serving. For example, I have a bill to give state employees a holiday, Juneteenth. Um, that is something we may want to incorporate in the in whatever recommendations we make to the legislature when we finish our final report. Obviously, I would love for the task force and every task force member 
to advocate on behalf of my bill. Um, but as uh, Mr. Newman has said, that may not be the appropriate methodology to do it. But a way we could do it, and again, I'm not advocating one way, it's just as an example, um, and Mr. Newman can correct me, if we were to put that in to our legislation or who could make that as one of our, our recommendations moving forward, that could be one way when we finish the report uh, to, to make some of what we want known. Yeah, yes, doing something like that through uh, amendment legislation or future legislation would be certainly change the change what's permitted. That, any other questions from um, the task force to Attorney Newman on uh, this potential action item, pu potential public actions, including advocacy letters? I think in our past hearings, we characterize this as low hanging fruit. <laughs> Member Tamaki, you're recognized. Thank you. <clears throat> well, this, this is not a question to uh, Michael Newman so much as just an observation. So <clears throat> one of the resource materials um, I think that Camila um, was referring to and, and me as well was the guide that was uh, created by the Ohio State University Divided uh, Communities Commission, which um, the project study truth commissions both domestically and internationally, redress and reparations efforts both internationally and domestically, and uh, came up with you know certain criteria uh, in terms of the varying degrees of success of each of these sort of efforts. And one of the um, one of the recommendations for um, this kind of project is to see if we can have an early win, an early victory, low-hanging fruit, so that we don't wait until you know June of 2023 to announce our existence. And so I think, um, in that spirit, the chair was was mentioning this. I think it's a great idea that we we try to explore these things. And I think there are things that are coming up that we ought to think about. Um, and as I said, until now. We've pretty much been flying under the radar screen. But I think when the uh, part one of the report comes out, because it is so groundbreaking uh, and because it will issue with the imprimatur of the state of California, uh, that's going to be a big deal. And <clears throat> for example, maybe we ought to think about when it is released, um, how we make that accessible to the public in ways that it could be used uh, immediately by educational institutions by groups, by the faith community, by civil rights organizations, uh, by young people. You know, maybe there are things that can be translated within it into um, bits and pieces because it will have 12 chapters, but there may be a focus, for example, on housing or on, on public health that we heard today. I mean, some of these stories are, they're absolutely jaw-dropping, they're gut-wrenching, and they're so indicative of, you know, how to the degree in which this history has been erased. And so um, the fact that um, some of this stuff, even though it's over 100 years old in terms of when it happened, the fact that, you know, it's newsworthy today, you know, whether it's Tulsa or there was a Washington Post article on its uh, research uh, you know, identifying over 1,700 Congress people that were slaveholders, things that are, are part of American history but are largely unknown. And <clears throat> I think this is part of the task force's charge to educate the public. And, and this is probably what a racial reckoning means. It, you have to take a look at what's happened and reveal it, shine a light on it. So I think, um, and that's something maybe together with the task force, the communications consultant and the DOJ, we can all work together and time this. Um, and I, I think certainly that would qualify as an early win, uh, a low hanging fruit, you know, that would get us, you know, on the, both on the scene in California and, and on the nation. Um, the community engagement process, which Dr. Grills talked about, I think that is also an early 
win uh, because it's so unprecedented. Uh, the Japanese American redress hearings was a game changer for our community, uh, really moved the needle of public opinion. Um, I'm hoping for you know a similar outcome uh, when that starts. And that is also, I would call, an early positive you know, accomplishment. Um, Friday, tomorrow, uh, Lisa Holder and I will talk about um, the task force's exercise of its powers to compel uh, state agencies to produce information and data. Um, and that might also qualify as sort of something that um, the public will, will be very interested in that will benefit both the task force's report and also um, public information. And this is in connection with um, race, uh, uh, data uh, uh, tracking race of uh, charging, sentencing, diversion decisions, um, and so on. And so <clears throat> we'll leave that for uh, Lisa to present tomorrow, but that's also uh, something. So I, I think within the uh, purview of what we're authorized to do, if we think creatively, um, we can break off bits and pieces of this and then begin to work uh, with the community, again, in no more than two task force members per, you know, topic, so we don't violate Bagley Keene. But I think uh, as Cheryl Grills has shown, you know, one or two of us, um, I mean, one person in that case accomplished a huge amount. So, uh, but it's in conjunction with non-task force members, other members of the public. So I think uh, in the spirit of that uh, Ohio State Divided Communities Guide, I think we can start thinking about um, how, how we can actuate and implement in an early way some of the, the uh, mission part of the task force that we've been talking about. Um, Chair Thank Moore. you. Yes. If I may be um, recognized. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Um, on that point, um, member Tamaki and, and all the members, um, when we circulate, I'll be speaking about this in a moment in my updates, but when we circulate the um, draft of the first report, part of the, part of the concept of the draft is going to be recommendations. So to member Tamaki's um, point and suggestion, there will be opportunities for the members to add in various recommendations keyed to each of the chapters of the report um, for, for some of these points. Um, it's not exactly the same as writing a letter, but certainly some of these things, recommendations can come out from the task force in report one uh, in a way that will start to um, you know, assert the recommendations. Those are obviously got to be voted on as the whole report does. Um, and so that will be an early opportunity for the members to contribute that kind of, of suggestion. Okay, thank you, Attorney Newman, for that clarification. And also thank you, Member Tamaki, for that um, incredible insight. I really appreciate that. Um, are there any other questions or comments from Task Force members on this issue? Okay, hearing no other questions, we'll move to our next agenda item, which is um, inf information item, Department of Justice updates. So Attorney Newman, you are recognized. Uh, thank you very much, Chair Moore, um, for acknowledging uh, this me so that we can provide this update. Um, with today's update, I have just a couple of items uh, to raise to your attention, and then, of course, we'll take any questions you have. Um, First, I'd like to briefly update you regarding the current status of the availability of virtual meetings to the task force. We continue to operate under the extension uh, that the governor issued through March. Tomorrow, you will hear from the chair and member Scott Lewis about a potential plan for moving forward uh, with the task force's meetings. During that discussion, it will be important for the task force to consider options for either the extension of the emergency order allowing for virtual meetings, or if in the future a different order is issued. Specifically, it will be important for us to know your collective preference 
for virtual or in-person meetings should virtual meetings become available after the task force has already scheduled a meeting in person. For example, if the task force votes to have an in-person meeting in April, um, as the current order uh, terminates in March, and then the governor extends the order to allow for virtual meetings after the task force's March meeting, it will be helpful for us to know whether the task force would prefer to shift to virtual meetings as originally planned or proceed with the in-person meeting. Uh, in the past, without have, having, after having the task force having vote, voted on setting meetings in person, um, we've had an intervening meeting. It may be that we do not have an intervening meeting. And so that's why we're asking the task force to start thinking about it. Since you'll be having the discussion tomorrow, I'm just presenting this for each of you to think overnight before you have the conversation tomorrow about meeting plan moving forward. Next, DOJ staff, as I mentioned earlier, continue to work through the drafting of the first report that we anticipate providing to you for review in advance of the February meeting. When, per your prior instruction to the DOJ, it will be discussed amongst the members and feedback will be given. We will then endeavor to work closely with you to complete and finalize the report in advance of your vote to adopt it in April so that DOJ has sufficient time to format and post the report by the statutory deadline of June 1. In addition to welcoming your active participation and engagement through your review of the drafts, we'll be providing you over the next few months, uh, I wanted to present for your consideration the option uh, to designate members of the task force to work closely with DOJ staff in, on individual chapters that they're either experienced on or knowledgeable about uh, or just very interested in to facilitate our finalization in a manner that most closely reflects your opinions, preferences, and positions. This can be done with individual designees or through one or more advisory committees that would work directly with DOJ staff to finalize report one. As I mentioned, each of you will have multiple opportunities between now and the report being finalized to weigh in, give edits, suggest changes, suggest additions, and we welcome those. Very critical that we get that input from all of the members so that the report ultimately reflects the task force's opinions and conclusions. That's the extent of our report. So with that, I thank you, Chair Moore, Vice Chair Dr. Brown, members of the task forces for the, of the task force for providing us this opportunity to share the updates. And of course, I welcome any questions you may have about anything I've just discussed or anything I have not addressed. Thank you, Attorney Newman. So are there any questions for Attorney Newman from the task force on the information presented? you recognize so with respect to um task force members working with the department of justice to review the drafts provide input i mean that seems like a a good way to to move the process along um is that something that the task force should be doing uh before we end our meeting tomorrow or well, what is the, is there a recommendation on how we, we go about doing that? Uh, so according to the vote of the task force in the previous meetings, you'll be getting a draft um, in the February meeting for your discussion, consultation, and further direction. It's not coming up for a vote, it's just a draft. Um, so at this point, we're finalizing that draft uh, to get it in shape for it to be reviewed by, by all of you. Um, so I think probably would be something to consider in the February meeting um, at the time that you all review that. Um, and I say that because I think some of you may have particular interests, as I've said, in certain subjects. Um, some of you may have experience or education that aligns with some of the subjects. Um, ideally, we'd like to have you know direct as much direct 
task force involvement as possible. Um, again, so that it ultimately reflects um, your views. And when ultimately you all vote on a final version, it'll be helpful if there are differences of opinions or questions or um, interests in items that were either not covered or were covered and how they were covered. It, it'd probably be the most helpful to you all to have other task force members that you can engage with in the meeting when this is ultimately discussed and voted on. Um, so that's really what I'm talking about. It's not something anybody needs to volunteer for now for us. Of course, you, like I said, this is gonna come to each of you and we welcome each of your edits and suggestions directly to DOJ staff, um, either in advance of uh, or, or during or after uh, the February meeting when it gets discussed. Um, it's our primary goal to make sure that the report reflects exactly what you all want it to reflect. Um, what I'm suggesting is um, if there's a desire amongst the task force to have, you know, even more hands-on involvement, it'd be helpful to have that sort of on a on a section by section basis, so people understand where their focus should be um, within the report, um, and so we understand who we should be engaging. If that's a, a choice the task force chooses to make. Okay, thank you, Member Tamaki. I had a similar question. Um, so, are there any other questions from the task force? Well, hearing no further questions on inf information item, um, Department of Justice updates, we will conclude that portion of the agenda. Thank you very much, Attorney Newman, um, for, for providing those updates. So the next item on the agenda is recess until tomorrow at 9 a.m. And so before we recess, I just wanted to provide space since we are a bit early provide any space for um, our STEAM task force members to ask any lingering questions or provide any comment or insight based on today. If not, we can recess. Okay, without further ado, this meeting is recess and we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>